Hey guys, Mark here, and I finally got a new PC build for you. It's been a few months since I bought that specked out iMac behind me, so I'm finally out of bankruptcy and I was able to put together some parts to do another gaming PC build. And this is it. I'm quite happy overall with how this one turned out in terms of how it looks, how it performs, even though there's a lot of things I could have done differently and there are a few gripes I have about it, but I'll cover all that and a lot more in this video, so let's jump right into exactly what components went into this build. First off is the case, and this is the Geek A50. Big thanks to Geek for sending this one out for review. It's definitely an interesting small form factor mini ITX case. It's got a Dan Case A4 vibe to it, and it's configured in a similar way to that case with a few obvious differences. First off, this case costs less than half as much as the A4, but you are sacrificing some things like the Dan Case's all aluminum construction, this one's almost entirely plastic, as well as the fact that you have to build it. Like Geek's other cases, the A50 comes flat packed in a box and you have to assemble it like it was IKEA furniture. And trust me, this process is just as infuriating. I spent the better half of four hours on this build and most of it came from just putting the case together, and that's with the experience of building one of their cases in the past. However, once it's all complete, you do get the satisfaction of having built your own PC case, kind of like how cool it was to finish a LEGO build when you were a kid. On top of that, the case actually looks awesome. I love the matte black color, and though there are some tiny fit and finish blemishes here and there, the final product is great for what you pay for it. Cable management was difficult given the small size of the case, but not impossible since most of the PSU cables could be tucked away behind the SSD tray. The only other thing that I really didn't like was the way that the power supply gets its fresh air. Since there's no real room for a 92mm fan below the power supply, it has to rely on the rather small holes here on the front for its own intake, not to mention it has to pass through this SSD shroud. If you were to install another SSD here, you'd almost entirely choke off the PSU's access to fresh air. Not an ideal situation. Now we'll come back to talking about the case more when we discuss the performance of this build, but for now, let's just talk about the more important internals. For our CPU, I went with an Intel i5-9400. I have a couple of reasons for this, but it mainly boils down to two things. Price to performance, and power draw or TDP. I could have gone with a Ryzen 3600 instead, but at the time I built this PC, Ryzen 3000 ready mini ITX motherboards were damn near impossible to find here in Canada. Along with the 9400, we have a Gigabyte Z390i motherboard and 16 gigabytes of HyperX Fury 2666 RAM. As the title would suggest, I went with an RTX 2070 Super for the GPU. This particular 2070 Super is the EVGA blower model, and while I much prefer the open air style coolers because they generally perform better and they run quieter, this blower style allows hot air to be ejected outside the case instead of ambiently flowing throughout this tiny little case. Whenever you're working in a really small form factor mini ITX case like this one, it's usually a better idea to go with a blower style card so that you aren't passing on the heat from the GPU to all the other components in the build. For storage, we have a 500 gigabyte Samsung 860 Evo and to cool our i5-9400, we have the Cryorig C7 CPU cooler. Finally, our power supply is an SFX power supply, the Corsair SF450 otherwise known as my biggest regret when it comes to this build. When I started buying the original parts of this build, I originally intended to put an RTX 2060 in here, which as most of you know, has a lot lower of a TDP than a 2070 Super. A 450 watt power supply in that case is totally fine, but along came the 2070 Super with its pretty awesome price to performance ratio, and lo and behold, our 450 watt PSU is no longer a great or even good choice. However, at peak load, our total system draws around 380 watts, so we're still somewhat okay. Generally speaking, you wanna keep your power draw at around 50 to 60% of the PSU's max output for optimum efficiency and you know lifespan of the PSU, but with all the benchmarking and gaming I've done since I've built this thing, I haven't had any issues yet, so I'm not gonna bother upgrading until I need to, and fingers crossed, that's gonna be a while because SFX PSUs are not cheap. So with all that said, let's get into some benchmark numbers. Up first is the Synthetic Geekbench 4 benchmark to test our CPU, which gave us a single core score of 4893 and a multi-core of 20,018. Not bad, but it falls a bit behind the Ryzen 3600 numbers, which hit 5569 in single core and 28528 in multi-core. My regret builds steadily higher. Moving on to gaming benchmarks, we'll start with Project Cars 2. In 1440p and max settings, we were hitting average frame rates of 105 FPS with the 1% low in the low 70s. Dropping the resolution down to 1080p, we can see average frame rates go up to 129 and the 1% low climbing to nearly 100. 
In everyone's favorite GPU buster, Shadow the Tomb Raider, we split the benchmarking into two groups. 1440p with ray trace shadows on and off, and 1080p with ray trace shadows on and off. In both cases, the preset was set to ultra. In 1440p with RTX off, we were hitting almost 100 FPS on average and a 1% low of 72. With RTX on, the numbers fall to 69 on average and 51 as our 1% low. In 1080p with RTX off, we hit an average of 128 frames per second and a 1% low of 96. When we turned RTX on in 1080p though, the average frame rates came down to 84 with the 1% low falling to 54. RTX is pretty demanding, but it makes the game look incredible, I gotta say. Not worth the average frame rate drop in my opinion, but still incredible nonetheless. Then we have Dirt Rally. It's a few years old now, but it still looks great, especially when maxed out. At 1440p, 84 FPS was our average frame rate, and 69 FPS was our 1% low. In 1080p, we hit 123 FPS on average, and 94 FPS was the 1% low. In No Man's Sky, running at 1440p, we averaged 114 FPS with a 1% low of just 11 FPS, and in 1080p, we had an average of 136 and a 1% low of 19. Don't worry about those low 1% numbers, as in this game, No Man's Sky is still a relatively indie game, and it's not all that well optimized yet. We'll end off the gaming benchmarks with GTA 5 running at 1440p. We averaged 87 FPS with a 1% low of 56 FPS, and in 1080p we had an average of 101 FPS and a 1% low of 58 FPS. Now, a few things about noise and thermals. Unfortunately, I ran into some problems with both of those things for the same reason. Geek was kind enough to send out these 92mm fans, which they sell alongside the Geek A50 to go into the top of the case, but I found them to be extremely loud. On top of that, there aren't many positions for fan mounting, just two at the top here really. There's mounting points for another one underneath the PSU, but given that's where all of the PSU cables are, it's almost impossible to put one there. For this particular case, I recommend picking up two Noctua NFA9s for the top to provide you with a little bit of a thermal performance boost and noise reduction. Just make sure that they're the 14mm kind so that they fit inside the A50. The 25mm A9s just won't fit there properly. Because the 2070 Super is in taking air directly from outside the case and blowing it outside though, I didn't run into much of a thermal issue there. The way this case is set up is actually pretty cool. The GPU is mounted on the back side of the motherboard with the PCI extension cable running to the correct slot on the motherboard. If you were gonna use an open air cooler, I suspect that this setup would minimize the amount of hot air that gets to the other components since it sort of has its own chamber, though I still went with a blower card to be safe rather than sorry. In most games, the card peaked at 80 degrees and stayed there consistently. In some super demanding games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider with RTX turned on though, I saw spikes up to 82 degrees Celsius, which is getting kinda spicy. The CPU, however, seemed fine with our CryoRig C7 cooler hovering around 55 to 56 degrees and never even coming close to the 72 degree maximum. Overall, I think this is a pretty successful build for a mid to high performance gaming PC in such a small form factor. I still wish I'd put a Ryzen 3600 in here with a slightly larger 550 watt power supply, but you live and you learn. The build still pulls some pretty decent frame rates and it looks awesome in doing so. I've got a very special project planned for this gaming build coming within the next week or two, so make sure you're subscribed if you're not already to find out when that video drops, or if it's out already, it'll be like right here or something, so you can click on that. If you're interested in any of the parts I talked about here today, I'll leave them in the description down below. If you like this video, please give this video a like and consider subscribing to support my channel. And as always, have a great day.